assault and attack. Take refuge in the Lord. We need everyone to dig deeper, to lay the foundation so that we can stand tall for the Lord. Good morning, Gateway. It's good to be with you this morning. It's so good to not be stuck in the Orlando airport. Last time I was with you, I uh, was telling you that if something seems too good to be true, then uh, you need to be cautious because it very well could be. And uh, I had found these airline tickets to Florida that were just at such a price, it was, it was almost too good to be true. And I was wondering if I'd really have a flight. Well, the flight down was no trouble um, <clears throat> till we got to the Orlando airport. That was a different story. It took two hours to fly down. It took two and a half hours to get our luggage. But uh, coming back, it took three days to fly back from Florida. That was during the heyday of the post-Christmas season, if you'll remember. And actually, uh, on the third day that uh, they postponed our flight, uh, they sent me an email the night before, and they said, you will have a flight tomorrow morning, but we'd like to buy your airplane. This, this was the airline. We'd like to buy your, your airplane tickets. What would you sell the airline, their airline, airline tickets back to them for? I knew they did such a thing as that. Uh, but I'd never had that done to me before. They, they sent me an email with a blank line on it. said, put your price in this blank, blank line and send it back to me. Well, I emailed my son, J.W., and I said, Jay, what, what should I put in there? He said, Dad, put $45,000. <laughs> I, did, I didn't do it. We were really wanting to get back to West Virginia because it really is good to, good to be back uh, home with you this morning. And I, I'm praying that Dave and Jennifer have a a better drive back. I'm told that they're driving back, and uh, we pray that uh, they'll have a good drive back. They had a wonderful vacation in the Caribbean, and uh, I got to speak to David as he was boarding, um, and uh, I, he was so excited and looking forward to it. I know he really appreciates the gift that, that you gifted them, and he asked if I would cover while he was gone, which I'm, I'm delighted to do. We're going to look at the end of the book of Luke this morning. If you want, want to turn in your own Bible, I hope some of you do. It'll be on the screen as well. But uh, at the end of uh, the book of Luke, there is uh, Jesus' conclusion to a sermon that Luke calls a sermon on the plain. Uh, Matthew records uh, even more of this sermon. And Matthew, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he calls it the Sermon on the Mount. But both sermons end with the same concluding story. And that's the story that we're looking at this morning. Jesus concluded his sermon with it, and we're going to begin ours. And Jesus said his conclusion this way. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I'll show you what he's like. He's like the man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Let's pray. Could we please, Lord, bless this time that we have together as we hear your concluding words to uh, a sermon that has become famous around the world now that so many people have heard, but fewer people have put into practice in their lives. Help us be like the, the wiser builder who not only hears, but actually does what you said can be done to ensure a good foundation that our lives could be built upon. That's our prayer, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray it. God's people said, amen. Now, I have a confession to make. I feel a little bit like a fish out of water this morning because I've been asked to preach a sermon on a subject that I know absolutely nothing about, and that is building a house. How many of you have ever built a house before? Can I see your hands? Just a couple of you, ladies and gentlemen here this morning. Well, you have uh, some skills and experience that I have 
never had in my life. I have never built a house. I don't know if I could sleep in a house that I built. I'd probably stay awake all night worrying if I built it right. Are those screws and nails going to hold? Did I use the right boards and block? Uh, and, and if the storm comes, is, is it going to bring it all crashing down upon me? But th now that's the point of Jesus' parable, though, that building a house that won't fall, that's the goal. And how the secret to building such a house lies under the ground. It's the foundation, whether it's built on solid rock or, as Matthew says, on sinking sand. I told you that this parable is told in both of those uh, concluding chapters, Matthew 7 and Luke uh, 6. Matthew uses uh, the, the description of the ground of the foolish man who built his house on sinking sand. And Matthew calls him foolish because he should have known his house would not be able to stand the test of time. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I hiked across the property that I grew up on. The place has been abandoned for over 40 years now, and it's all grown up. It looks like Vietnam out there. I couldn't even pull my car off the road. Um, couldn't see the house anymore, but it was still there, at least the front part of the old brown house, the part that was built on cinder block foundation. The back of the house has fallen in. It was just built on two sand stone corners with a shallow crawl space beneath and and that was not enough to support it all these years and the back of the house is, is pretty much gone uh, but the old um, uh, goat shed and 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 chicken house that I used to spend so much time in are completely gone there, there is no <laughs> there is nothing left I looked for a nail there is nothing there they are complete now neither one of them had any foundations uh, beneath them. They were just two before sticking into the ground. Uh, but uh, th all that's there today is just two leveled out pieces of ground in, in the hillside. Other than that, you wouldn't know anything was there. How do you explain that? Each of these uh, houses of sorts had to endure the very same storms. They were, uh, they were all three of them were within stone's throw of each other. So, so they all endured the, the same environment, the same test of time. How come only one part of one house survived? Well, we all know why. It's the foundation. There was more time and more effort and more expense put into the foundation of one, at least part of one, than the others. And as a result, that's the only part that survived. And that's exactly what happens in Jesus' parable. The house that survived had been well built, is Matthew's terminology, or excuse me, Luke's terminology. Uh, it was built by a man who dug deep. That's what our English uh, translation says. And, and it's trying to translate two Greek verbs. Jesus uses two verbs to emphasize what this man did. The, the effort of this man is what Luke really uh, emphasizes in this parable. This man went to great extremes. He didn't just dig a foundation. He dug deep. Um, the Greek word for dig is skapto. He dug, but he bathuno, he dug down deep. Some of you are familiar with bathysphere the original name for the submarine, that which would go down deep into this world, Bathuno. He not only scopto dug, he dug Bathuno down. He went down deep into the ground. The New American Standard Bible translates uh, these two Greek verbs <clears throat> with a footnote by saying literally the man dug and went deep. Now, Jesus does this to emphasize the effort that this man is going to to lay a good foundation. Only after digging down deep did he lay his foundation. He, he, did, not, he did not pour any cement, lay any block, not the first stone, until he hit bedrock or Petra uh, is the word Jesus used. Not Petra. They sound the same in Greek. 
They're from the same root. Petros is a piece of rock. Petra is a massive rock. Petros is what Jesus called Simon Peter, who openly identified for the first time who Jesus was. Uh, Jesus says, who do, who do men say that I am? And, and, uh, and Peter answers for the first time, you're the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Petros. You are a small piece of rock, Peter. And on this Petra, a mass of rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Against it. Petra is massive. Petra was the name given to the capital city of um, uh, the Nabitan in, Empire uh, in southern Georgia. It's, it's a city that's carved out of sl- solid rock cliff, uh, popularized in the uh, Indiana Jones and the Last crusade movie. I hope I'm getting the right Indiana Jones movie. But that's the library of the city there. That, that carving is 7,000 years old. How does a stone structure stay up for 7,000 years? It is carved out of Petra. Solid, massive rock. And that's what Jesus says his church has been built upon. When you confessed that you believed Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, you were confessing an ancient confession that has held up the church for 2,000 years now. We're built upon that kind of a foundation. That's the kind of massive rock that Jesus is talking about at the end of his Sermon on the Mount or here in the Sermon on the plain. It, it is a foundational stone in which the entire house will be supported. It's not stones, rocky soil. It's not little pieces of rock. It's one solid bedrock. One Greek scholar uh, translates uh, this passage with Jesus saying this, Everyone coming to me and hearing my words and doing them, I will show you to whom he's like, like is he to a man building a house who dug out and went deep and placed a foundation upon the rock mass. He dug and he dug and he dug and he dug down deep. He puts in extra time, extra effort, effort and expense until he hits pay dirt. Solid rock upon which he can build a solid home that will be able to withstand any storm. And it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. He was still digging holes and trenches and drainage ditches while the other man was finishing his roof. But it didn't matter. This man knew that building a solid foundation would be worth it. It would prove itself worth it when the inevitable storms of life would come which is probably pretty good advice when it comes to building a house. I don't know. I've never done that. But Jesus really wasn't talking about building a house, was he? He's talking about building what? A life. He's talking about you and I building our lives, lives that might withstand any storm that this life or the life to come might throw at us. And you do remember that there is an eternal storm coming, right? When the wrath of God will blow across this world. When, as David reminded us last week, the Lord is going to wipe the grin off of a rebellious world that has thumbed its nose at God and God's way of living for the last time. God's wrath is coming. Will your house be able to stand? When that kind of a storm blows in? And if not, how do we prepare for that kind of a storm? Well, in the analogy of the parable, we do that with a whole lot of digging. 
and discovering what Jesus wants done and then doing it. That's the real point of Jesus' parable. Doing. Not just hearing, but doing. James says it this way, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Only yourself. I mean, we're all here this morning to hear, but that's, that's not the litmus test that God is using. He's waiting to see how much of this hearing we'll put into our doing. Jesus prefaced this parable by saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my word, and does them. I'll show you what he's like. He's like a digger, man. Uh, He considers all that extra time, effort, and expense worth it because of the solid foundation he'll build upon. And I'm sure all the back-breaking work in the hot sun and the blisters on the hands and the sore aching muscles in his back, tempted him to quit long before he was finished, but he didn't quit, he wouldn't quit, because the value that he placed upon having a place that was built upon such a solid foundation was worth it. Now, what kind of a value do we place upon having a life that is built upon a solid foundation in Christ, capable of withstanding whatever storm this life or the next blows at us. Is, is, is it really worth all this digging and discovering and doing what Jesus wants done in contradistinction to what the world says is okay to be done? Because that's how Jesus says this solid life is built. Not forward tough, but forever tough. You want a forever tough life? It's going to take some work. It's going to take some digging. It's going to take some doing. But it'll be worth it in the end. Now, how much time are you willing to put in building a life like that? Both for ourselves, but also for our kids. How much sacrificing are you willing to do to pass this kind of a solid foundation onto your next generation? I was so happy in between services to sit out in the foyer and drink my cup of tea and just watch all the moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas bringing in their little ones and their little bit bigger ones. And, uh, and I thought, man, there's people that see the importance, not just of believing these things and doing them seems themselves, but making sure they pass on this to the next generation. It's remarkable. It's wonderful. There's going to be so many more solid homes that are going to be able to withstand the coming storms because of what you're doing for these young people. And, and think about it this way, too. What else are you going to do with your time? I'm not saying there's not other things you can do with your time. I've often thought about that now that I'm a retired preacher. You know, do I, (laughs) what else can I do on Sunday morning but go to church? You know, I've gone to church all my life. I I know there's another life out there. I know something's happening out there. I don't know what it is. I've never participated in it. But obviously, the majority of the world finds plenty of other things to do besides go to church on Sunday mornings. I'm going to stick with Sunday mornings. It's served me well so far. I'm going to stay with that. And then preach every, every chance I, I get on, on those Sundays as well. But th- I'm told by the world there are other things uh, that we could be doing. How, how, how much am I going to be investing my life in the time for my kids? What else could I do with my time, I guess is what I'm saying. If I didn't do this, what else would I do? And I thought about this was this week, and I thought, well, I could waste it. I, I could always waste <laughs> time. Uh, and that's what some people do, uh, wasting their time away in Margaritaville, <laughs> searching for that lost shaker of salt. You think someone would have found it by now? Uh, <clears throat> now, I'm proud to have met some folks in this church who've had enough of that Margaritaville life and uh, enough of what um, the Chinese call Tang Ping, 
I, I never heard this term before, but I read up on it, and I thought, man, that's a great description. Tang Ping in uh, Mandarin literally translates to lying flat. Tang Ping. And it's a slang term in Mandarin for slackers in this life. What do they do? They just spend all their time lying flat. And uh, the Apostle Paul reminds the church at Thessalonica, uh, he says, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, he should not what? Eat. He should not. Paul was talking about Tang Ping people, the lying flat people. Maybe a hungry belly will motivate them to quit wasting their lives away in Margaritaville, and maybe they'll get busy digging and discovering and maybe even doing the kind of things that Jesus wants, wants done. We, you can make that choice, I suppose. You could just say, well, I've got a certain amount of time in this life. Don't know how much time it is, but I think I'll just waste it. I'm not advising that. I'm just saying that's an option, obviously, that some people take. But we can also spend it. We, we can spend our time. It's not a waste. We're spending it. But often we are spending it on frivolous things, things that really don't add up to a hill of beans when you consider eternal things. Uh, it's not a waste of time. It's an expenditure. But it's spent on lesser things, lesser important things. Uh, <clears throat> Anyone here made a New Year resolution this year? I know I have, so don't feel bad if you have. There's nothing wrong with New Year's resolutions. I've made a couple of you have, have made them. Um, and we may have had someone here make a New Year's resolution like the number one most popular New Year resolution to make in America. Anyone know what that is? What's the most popular New Year's resolution in America? To lose weight. Right? That's number one. Um, I'm not t- saying it's mine. I'm just saying it is, it's number one. And number two is to quit smoking. Okay, so, I mean, when you look at those two and you say, you know, that's, that's not a bad expenditure of time, right? I, I mean, for some of us, I'm not saying which ones of us, but for some of us, those would be pretty good New Year's resolutions to make. Nothing wrong with that, to spend time getting in better physical shape, whether it's your lungs or it's your belly. You know, either one, uh, better shape is... is is better. So that may be a good thing. I admit one of them would be a really good thing for me. But even then, as a believer in Jesus, I have to remember how the Lord's apostle was directed to tell us to train ourselves for godliness. For while the bodily training is of some value, Godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now, that puts a little different spin on it. Some expenditures, they're good, but there could be better, more eternal. Reminds me of Tim Duncan's little poem that says, Good, better, best, never let it rest until your good is better and your better best which seems to suggest there's always room for improvement. That's what that poem tells me, to keep trying to improve. Study a little longer, practice a little harder, manage your time a little better, be a little kinder, uh, get in a little better shape. And all those are good, maybe better, certainly better than wasting your time. But are they best? Are they the best things? in which to spend your time. Paul seems to be saying that what we choose to spend our time improving matters too. The choice itself. What are we choosing to improve? And will they be eternal things or things that will only be better in this life? In eternity, will they add up to a hill of beans? What are we going to spend our time doing this year? I find that very interesting, those two words, spend and time. I mean, when I think of spend, I think of money. I don't even know why I do that when I think of money, but I do. When I think of money, uh, spending money. But we also talk about spending time. And uh, 
I did a little research uh, this last couple of weeks, and it seems that, at least in the English language, we've been using those references together for a long, long time, spending time. Um, in fact, at least since the 14th century, in Old English, um, they were talking about spending time. Uh, one uh, paper I read said the, the oldest reference to spending time in the English language is a, is a poem that roughly reads something like this, the lifetime that I've been lent in idleness I have spent. It's a lifetime of regret for all the tang ping ways of living I spent in idleness. And, it, and it's a regret over a life not well spent. Which led me to a Wall Street Journal article uh, commenting on the kind of regret of life, of a life not well spent. And, um, and the uh, Wall Street Journal article was talking about the go-to verb for what we do with time is spend. And researchers say it might be better to think of time as something we invest rather than something as we spend. And I, I've never ever used those two words together, invest time. I, I've never put that together. I thought, this is very interesting. I wonder what they're going to say here. This is the Wall Street Journal now that's mainly concerned with investing money. But no, this article is about investing time. And it says it, we, we need to think about investing time, using our precious hours to accumulate a wealth of fulfillment and meaning that our future selves will be able to draw upon. The article goes on to say time, like money, can be allocated to building wealth, meaning, and happiness in the years to come. Investing the time. So let's think about time, whatever time we have left here on earth. Let's think about that kind of uh, uh, verb for time, investing it. Because that's what the wise builder in Jesus' parable is actually doing. He's investing the time that he has and his energy and resources as well. He's investing that by digging down deeper until he strikes bedrock upon which he's going to lay a foundation against the years to come. Now, Jesus lays that down as the perfect illustration of the wise person, the wise man, the wise woman, the wise young person who not only comes to Jesus and listens to Jesus. That's what we're all doing this morning. We've all come here this morning to listen to Jesus. But that's not the wise person, Jesus says. The wise person is a person that comes to Jesus and listens to Jesus and then actually tries to incorporate the teachings of Jesus into their life by actually doing what Jesus wants to be done by digging down deeper and doing more uh, discovery and, and, and putting more into action uh, for Jesus than we have ever done before. Or by returning to doing more of what Jesus once done like we did in prior years before. Some of us did things for Jesus in years past that we're not continuing to do for Jesus now. And... And Jesus is calling us now back to return to those sure foundations and, and doing those things that Jesus wants done again. Now, this is in contradistinction to what our world is telling us is okay to be done. I mean, there'd be a lot of people in the world that would just totally disagree with everything I've said and everything that Jesus says. They would say, that was then, this is now. This is what is okay to be done now. This is how we live and let live now. Let people build foundations any way they, they want to live now. What, who's to say your foundation is any more certain than, than their foundation now? Jesus says, no, there, there is foundational truth that can be built upon that will give you a more solid home against the coming storms. And those are the kinds of homes we want to live in, amen? Amen. 
And those are also the kind of storms we want our kids to live in. We want them to have that kind of a sure foundation upon which they can build their lives upon in years to come as well. Now, we've been talking in symbols up to this point. Let's get very practical here. For some of us here, what this means is we may want to consider setting aside a regular time this year for systematically reading through the Bible. I mean, that'd be a pretty good way to dig down deep to bedrock to, to build a good foundation for your life upon, wouldn't it? To, I mean, I don't know, maybe many of you are doing this already, but I'm sure some of us are not. This may be a very good New Year's resolution to set aside a regular systematic time of reading through the Bible this year. Now, my mother-in-law used to do this every year. In fact, one year, Pooj asked me if I thought it was okay if she could, <laughs> if she could read her Bible from the back to the front because she'd read it so many times from the front to the back that she, uh, she wanted to do something a little new and, and novel. So instead of Genesis to Revelation, she was asking, would it be okay this year if I, I read my Bible from Revelation to Genesis? And I, <laughs> I said, well, I, I guess that'd be okay, Pooja. I never heard of anybody do anything like that before, but um, coming from you, I, I understand it. Uh, and she read her Bible from back to front. She, she was a truly remarkable woman that way who, among other things, literally knew her Bible backwards and forwards. You could do that. You could set that as a goal this year. I'm not saying read it from back to front, but you can set this as your goal to read the Bible uh, through this year, you, you know, three or four chapters a day, or the New Testament, one chapter a day. You finish in October, I think, that way. I mean, you can do this. You can set it as your personal goal. Be a great goal, good, solid, foundational teaching to build your life upon and, and the generations to come from you to build their life upon too. Now, for others of us, it may mean uh, some other kind of Bible reading program or, or an app on the phone. You know, there's a lot of Bible reading apps you can get on your phone now. Uh, in fact, I was very impressed with a, a young high school sophomore girl in uh, our church up north, uh, Cassie Orr. I, I heard by word of mouth that we had a young lady in our church that had read through the Bible on an app, on, on a version app on her phone. And so I called her in and talked to her about it and it, found out it was true. And I said, Cassie, could I interview you? And the, we'll put that out uh, in, in the cyber world to uh, encourage other young people that this could be done too. And she said, yeah, that would be fine. And I interviewed her and I said, now, Cassie, I want to make sure about something before I say something's not true. You actually read through the entire Bible on your phone. I mean, these, you read through the entire Bible on your phone. She said, yeah. I said, I'm the Old and the New Testament. Yeah. I read, I read through the entire Bible. She said, it really wasn't that hard. The app led me through it. I'd write it on my, read it on my ride to school. And uh, on my ride home from school, that was when I did most of my reading. You know, it was three or four chapters a day. And that wasn't that, wasn't that difficult at all, at all. And I thought, my goodness, somebody building a good a little sophomore girl. I'm not little. She's six feet tall. But, uh, you know, building a sure foundation to her as a young person for her life uh, to be built upon. Some of you could do that with your phones or, or get a daily devotional on your phone like, uh, like I choose to do. Uh, <clears throat> you, you don't have to do it on a phone, though. Don't discount yourself. You don't have to have a phone to, uh, to read the Bible. Uh, in fact, you can start listening to the Bible. Some of you uh, struggle a bit with your listening or you have or reading or you have more time to do listening, such as when you're driving. You can listen your way through the Bible on these MP3 files now. I, I know it's a little old school, but I have uh, a CD in my HHR uh, that I listen to. It's the New Testament. It's uh, digital files of the New Testament on one CD. I don't know if your car still have CDs or not, but mine still has one. And when I get in my car, start it up, it just pops right back up where I last left off. And I'm, I listen my way 
through the New Testament. And now that my radio's broke, I listen to it more and more. I should have broke the radio a long time ago. Uh, but it's, it's something that's not hard anymore to do. Uh, or think of this, think of this. Now, I know this is, this is high tech here, but you can actually read the Bible on paper now. Did you know that? You, you can actually find these things. They sell them in stores. You may have one on your bookshelf. You just may need to find it and dust it off and pull it out again. But you can actually read through uh, a book and read through the Bible on your own, uh, page through uh, page. Um, and there's so many different ways that you can do this. Uh, let, me, let me just give you an interesting one. Um, how many of you remember uh, the Revelation series that David preached through earlier last year? I, I think I got to do one of those messages too. He did like seven messages through the book of Revelation, and it was kind of a summary, kind of highlight type series. And I thought, uh, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, each week, there's 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, so seven days in a week. Each week, I'm going to read three chapters, maybe one day read four, but I'm going to read three or four chapters each day, and I read them on my back patio, and it was so interesting. Through his seven-week series, each week, I reread through the book of Revelation again. Man, that was so interesting in my life. I was just following his idea. He wanted to preach through the book of Revelation, and I thought, well, if he's going to preach through it, why don't I just read through it? And it was less than my newspaper reading each day. Less than my newspaper reading. And I made it through the book of Revelation seven times through that series. I, I just found that um, very, very uh, informing. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let me tell you something else uh, you can do that would be very interesting. I haven't done this, but I think it'd be very interesting to do this. Each Sunday, we have a focus verse, and David has a scripture that he bases his sermon upon. You know, you could go home after the Sunday service and you could read that entire chapter where his scripture came from. That could just be a New Year's resolution. On Sundays when you go home, uh, you know, you'd come to church on Sundays. I, I wouldn't advise you to quit doing that, but go home and, and then read the chapter in which the Sunday morning sermon came from. And then maybe on Monday, uh, start three chapters before and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday Read three chapters before that chapter that the sermon came from. And then on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you read three chapters afterward. That You'll have seven chapters, one chapter each day. And you will, by that reading, you will put every scripture that David preaches from in its biblical context. You will see exactly where the writer put that and why he put that there. It'll make so much more sense to you. In fact, some of you may be familiar with this book. If we could see it, please. Haley's Bible Handbook. Anybody have one of these Haley's Bible Handbooks here? We had a couple in the early service that had it. There was a time, I don't know if it's still true or not, but there was a time when Haley's Bible Handbook was the most selling English book in the world besides the Bible. It was, it was the number two selling English book. In fact, mine is a 1962 copy and it's the 23rd edition in 1962. It's a very, very popular uh, Bible handbook. Millions upon millions upon millions of these that are sold. But if you, in any of the editions, if you look at the table of contents, there will be, a, in caps, there will be a, uh, a listing that says, the most important page in this book. And then it'll give you a page number. Now, it changes from edition to edition what page number it is. But when you turn to that page number, it says this. The most important thing in this book is this simple suggestion, that each church have a congregational plan of Bible reading and that the pastor's sermon be from that part of the Bible read the past week, thus connecting the pastor's preaching with the people's Bible reading. Incredible, incredible thought. Now, Gateway does something like that. We call them life groups or small groups, uh, which would be another great way, by the way, of, of us digging deeper and, and discovering more and doing more of the things Jesus said we ought to be doing to build a sure and solid foundation to build our lives upon. Um, but in life groups, they, they choose scriptures that David has preached on Sunday mornings, and we have a chance to discuss them further and compare them with other verses uh, in our life group 
meetings as well. And if, if you're not in a life group or small group, whatever your group calls them, I, I'd encourage you to, to, to consider that as a New Year's resolution. Jump in and take one of these life groups for a spin. It's, it's a test drive. And there's lots of groups. They, I, they've actually let me jump into four now, and I, I think we've settled in on one of them. But uh, jump in and, and test them out. See which group might be right for you. And be a great New Year's re- resolution where each week you'll be digging a little deeper into what was preached Sunday morning, discovering more foundational truths to build your life upon, and then having some accountability partners, partners with the other people in your group to actually do these things, not just know these things, but actually begin doing these things, incorporating the teachings of Jesus into your life, building this more sure and solid foundation. The Bible says it this way. The Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, you can choose to live your Christian life all to yourself, holding yourself accountable. Okay, that's what Jesus says. That's what I need to do. I'm going to try to do that. You might be able to pull it off. But in a group, when you have other men and other women uh, learning the same truths and checking on one another, well, how'd you do last week with that new truth? How, how are you incorporating it into your life? Well, I, to be honest with you, I, I didn't do very well. And uh, maybe to get a little pat on the back or a little pat on the hind end to, to, to not just be a hearer, but to be a doer, too, in your life. I mean, life groups would be a great New Year's resolution for some of you to help you dig deeper, discover, and do more of what Jesus wants to be done. Uh, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes that says... Uh, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But that's predicated on the fact that you have a friend. You got somebody walking with you. So that when you slip, and we all do, and fall, we don't have to have the medic alert button and say, help, I've fallen, I can't get up. There's somebody there to help us up. Life groups can bring this kind of a helper into your life, someone who will actually be there to help you, (laughs) help you actually do what Jesus wants you to do in your life. Now, Gateway's going a step further that David announced last Sunday to help us build better foundations by designating foundations as our church strategic theme for this year, challenging us to dig deeper and discover deeper truths, uh, foundational truths, that now we'll build our lives upon. Very important truth. Truths like the, some of David's topics. God is real. Do you realize how, how a, much of a foundational truth that is? For you to be convinced that there is a God, He is there. He is real. Francis Schaeffer actually wrote a trilogy of three books one time, uh, The God who is there, um, the God uh, who has spoken, and the third one I can't remember right now, Um, but he is really there. He's truly there. God is real. That's a foundational truth that will change the way you build your whole house in this life, and that God created this world. It's his. That's going to make a difference and how you decide to live this life. God has a plan for your life. Do you know what that is? The Bible can be trusted. David's going to tell us what the Bible says about the truth of heaven and hell and God's plan of how we can enter one and avoid the other. These are, these are very crucial foundational truths upon which solid homes and lives can be built. Now, each last Sunday of the month this year, the Sunday morning sermon will address one of these foundational truths. And then on that last Sunday night of the month, parents and grandparents and life group leaders and anyone else interested will be invited to 
uh, to a training session here at the St. Albans campus and the Taze Valley campus that will teach us how to pass on these foundational truths to the next generation. Because it's not just us that we're interested in building solid homes that can withstand the coming storm, but it's the next generation as well. Now that we've come to believe these truths and and we've decided to build our lives upon these truths, how can we pass that desire on to the next generation too? At the same time, our kids will be learning about that same foundational truth in their Sunday school and their student ministry classes. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. I'm, I'm one of the young people. I, I'm a good example, but I'm one of the young people who was trained by this church. I was trained in the way I should go. I didn't always go in that way, I know. But I was trained in that way. And it's made a difference in my life. Where would I be without this church, without the Christian family I had, without Christian church camp? I don't. I have no idea what would have happened in my life, what my house would now look like. This makes a real difference in your life. That's why Gateway does all this for the kids. Gateway comes alongside parents and grandparents who see the importance of passing foundational truths of God to the kids, all in hopes that together we will all, young and old, begin discovering and doing more of what Jesus once done. And in the process, building our lives upon a much, much surer foundation. Amen. My, uh, <clears throat> my little kindergartner grandson down in Nashville came home from school this last Friday and he asked his big second grade t- uh, sister uh, if there was school tomorrow. He came home from Friday school and and ask Addie, is there school tomorrow? And Addie said, no, it's, it's a weekend. And little Benny said, oh, great, we get two days off. And, and Addie said, no, we get three days off. And Benny said, oh, that's right. This is Mark and Luke and King Day weekend. <laughs> well, little Benny's got a lot to learn, doesn't he? But he's going to. He's going to be okay, you know that? He's going to be all right. Because he's got a Christian mom, and he's got a Christian dad, and they've got a great Christian church that are teaching and passing these foundational truths down to their kids. And what was it Solomon said? A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. That's what we're talking about doing here. Incorporating what Jesus says into our lives by actually doing them. And I I hope you'll join us this year because it really does make a difference what we do with our time. We can waste it or we can spend our time on other things or we can invest it by using the time the Lord gives us this year on digging deeper, discovering more, and doing more of what Jesus wants done. That's the kind of life, Jesus says, can withstand the coming storm. The Bible says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. And they're not getting any less evil, are they? Let's stand. Close in prayer. Could we please? Lord Jesus, thank you for warning us of the coming storm. And may we take your storm warning seriously. For ourselves and for our kids. May we resolve to dig deeper and discover more and do more of what you want done. And when the storm comes, may our house 
stand.